Welcome to my channel where we explore the mysteries of the cosmos and delve into the fascinating world of astrology. I'm Kim Fairminer and in this video I'm joined by my friend Sam from Three Fates Apothecary and Astrology and we're looking at the upcoming solar eclipse and what it means for Australia and its people. Solar eclipses have long been regarded as powerful cosmic events and their effects can be felt in a myriad of ways both collectively and individually. So join us as we explore the solar eclipse forecast for Australia and discover what the heavens have in store for this amazing country. Hello, hello. We are here today to discuss the solar eclipse and what it means for Australia. You might remember my friend um, Sam from Three Fates Apothecary, who's here to um you know, delve into the amazing astrology that we've got happening in Australia at the moment. Um, how are you, Sam? Pretty good. Um looking forward to getting into this eclipse i know pretty amazing um i did want to pop back to the previous aries ingress chart now we talked about how um very briefly how because it was an aries rising chart um there was only really like a three-month window where this chart is super active but already we are getting some amazing pings on um, what we offered up in that video. Like <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it actually when there was a headline about um, this recent study about how you could mix the seaweed in with canola oil and per pour that over cattle feed and it was amazingly effective at reducing their burps. So that's yeah. how cattle produce the methane. I wasn't sure of that <laughs> ingress one and it makes you wonder. Um, we've also had like the pausing of interest rates and that's something else we talked about in the ingress chart and the high commissioner went to see Julian Assange the first um, official um, from the Australian government to see him over in Belmarsh in um, the UK for like years and years um, so I'd like to think that there was something kind of you know diplomatically happening in the background there although of course with that um Jupiter on the ascendant there. Laws are really an interesting focus. And um, I think we talked a lot about how that Jupiter is very enthusiastic, but slightly clueless there um, in the Aries, um, Aries mm. that section of Aries, not having any dignity. Um, and of course, big news this week was um, Peter Dutton and the Liberal Party saying no to the voice. We didn't get into the um, voice referendum very much at all in that um, Aries Ingress chart, but you can see the opposition leader here is the um, the moon over here in the 12th house. That's applying to Neptune um, and then onto Mars. And if you look at this headline, camouflaging, which is a super Neptunian word, I reckon, a resounding no, there's like a square to the voice, the planet, um, the third house relates to communication. Gemini is um, a sign very much um, linked to speech and communication. And this referendum that we're having, what Indigenous people are asking Australians to do is, um, you know, vote on a, a voice to parliament. And the opposition leader in that hard square angle has just said no. So it's just... Oh. Like, it, it's all there. Um, I've put the timestamps there too if you want to go back and have a look um, and listen to what we sort of said. So we're definitely going to get into the voice referendum. We're going to talk about Pluto, which is like right up there, angular and prominent at um, the top of the chart, as well as the coming solar eclipse. So we've got some really juicy stuff to cover. Um, I did want to sort of like, we're talking about the voice of parliament and people are probably going like, what? But um, I went to the Parliamentary Education Office, and, which is an organisation I haven't heard before, but it defines what the Australian Constitution is. So I'm just going to read this three-line quote. The Australian Constitution has properly been described as the birth certificate of a nation. It also provides the basic rules for the government of Australia. Indeed, the constitution is the fundamental law of Australia, binding everybody, including the Commonwealth Parliament and the Parliament of each state. Accordingly, even an act passed by a parliament is invalid if it is contrary to the constitution. And as I read that, I thought, wow, 
look at that um, Jupiter on the um, ascendant here in the Aries Ingress chart in Canberra. It's the ruler of the ninth house. And this conversation, um, this referendum that we're about to have about the law of Australia is like right there. It is front and center in that um, Aries Ingress chart. Um, the other angular planet in this Aries Ingress chart is Pluto. And that is really a key player in this upcoming solar eclipse. Um, so because Australia has been around for like oh, 200 and something years, um, we were settled slash invaded, although, you know, obviously look at the colour of my skin, I'm of invader um, <laughs> heritage, um, in 1788 when um, the Brits came and planted the Union Jack in Sydney Cove in 1788. Um, and we have the colonisation chart there. Um, I might just flip over to that now, but keep an eye on that um, Pluto. Um, actually, I've got all my notes here. We might just hold off on changing the thing. So in the 1788 colonisation chart, Australia's sun is at six degrees Aquarius and Pluto is at 15 degrees Aquarius. So Australia's Pluto return comes up in... 2032, 2033, and I reckon that'll be like the likely time frame for us becoming a republic just because it's such a potent planet of um, transformation. And I feel the activity of Pluto in this Aries Ingress chart and in the eclipse chart that we're going to look at um, means that this energy is starting now and the voice referendum is the next step in righting these historical wrongs that occurred like way back then. Um, and obviously the consequences of that um, event um, continues to affect Australians, um, Indigenous, non-Indigenous immigrants. Now, it's really, really important stuff. Um, so notice the position here. It's at um, like 29.57 Capricorn. It's going to be flipping over that um, final degree of Capricorn into the first degree of Aquarius all through this year. The Federation chart um, has two degrees Aquarius on the mid heaven. So just file that kind of early, do early few degrees of Aquarius away in your mind as we sort of talk. Um, and yeah, it's really lit up. It's freaking amazing. But of course, it started such a long time ago. Um, I'm going to put up two charts now. Here's the colonization chart on the right. Um, and I've circled that um, five degree sun on the six degree ascendant with the Pluto at 15 degrees Aquarius. And on the left here, I put the chart of Elizabeth I, Queen of England. So that's not Elizabeth II who just died. Um, and I wanted to shout out to astrologers Shu Yap and Melissa Lafara for this intriguing astrological fact. Um, you can see here that. Elizabeth I has um, Aquarius, the very first degree of Aquarius has that Pluto rising. Um, and in that Australian colonisation chart, we also have Pluto um, in the first house. So there's echoes between what she was trying to achieve. Um, and, you know, she was very, when I think of Elizabethan England, I think of um, William Shakespeare and the flourishing drama that occurred around that time. But they were also really renowned for maritime adventurers, aka pirates. Um, and there was a lot of that in the Caribbean and that um, shoring up of trade routes, which eventually led to colonisation. The East India Company started at that time. And all the stuff that um, Elizabeth was doing laid the early groundwork for colonial expansion, which happened, um, what, 200 years later after she was, um, you know, long gone from this earth. Sam also noted while researching for this video that Pluto was on those very degrees of Aquarius while Captain Cook was mapping the eastern seaboard of Australia about a decade before Arthur Phillip arrived with the first fleet. So this is area of the zodiac is key to um, Australia's modern history. So about 200, like, you know, a Pluto return for Elizabeth um, and now we're a Pluto return on almost from um, 1788 when Australia um, became a was colonized and now coming up to that point again 
in the next decade, what is it going to mean for our nation? So that's the kind of epic change and those big, huge cycles that Pluto brings up for us as Australians and that is active now um, with these mundane charts and the ingress and the eclipse. So that is the big picture context of um, what we've got happening here. It's, um, yeah, kind of like took the lid off the top of my head and started to blow my little mind. <laughs> Yeah, right. it's a pretty cool chart. I mean, it's interesting to see Pluto so active in all of these charts and also, you know, um, you know, Pluto's connection to mining, to imprisonment, like um, basically, I, you know, one of the big reasons, I guess, Australia was colonised. Totally. We started as a penal colony. I mean, even mm -hmm. we were locking up the um, dregs of British society, anybody that sort of um, didn't toe the line in that um, 18th century um, mm -hmm. was, yeah, shipped off. Um, yeah. Do you have colonial ancestry, Sam? Um, I think my, my um, ancestors came out here as priests, Ooh. God forbid. <laughs> so I don't know how that ended up. I'm, I'm sure my ancestors are very unhappy with me right now, but um, that's, that's yeah, that's how my, um, they came out here as priests apparently. Oh, that's interesting. A bit more Jupiterian mm. than um, Plutonic. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't have any um, convict ancestors, which was um, yeah, the word that I was meant to say, but, um, yeah, like it doesn't really matter how you got here or if you've been here for, you know, tens of thousands of years, like we're all part of this story and we're all going to be changed by what's going to unfold in the next few years. And um, I think mm. the key thing to remember with Pluto is that resisting, uh, resisting the necessary, the inevitable, um, only creates distress. Mm. All right. So... Why look at the solar eclipse? Um, that's why we're here today. Um, ancient societies had a lot of um, different beliefs and interpretations around eclipses, like because they all had their own sort of mythological framework, but generally they were viewed as ominous and terrifying events. If you think about being sort of... <laughs> you know, someone pre-modern pre world before we had electric lighting and before we were measuring, um, you know, things and had like before the average person, I guess, had a great, you know, a general knowledge of science and um, understanding and being educated um, as we are privileged to have today. There was a lot of um, superstition a lot of things that were explained by um, the priestly class in mythological terms. And more often than not, eclipses were thought of as a warning of some kind of impending disaster. And astrology carries a lot of that wisdom. And this is collective cultural wisdom that I think shouldn't be too easily dismissed with our um, modern scientific educations. Um, you know, these people survive without a lot of the um, technology and knowledge that we enjoy now. And mythological knowledge, traditional knowledge shouldn't be dismissed. So eclipses are also an opportunity for um, spiritual reflection and renewal because there's that connection between what we do on the earth and what's happening in the sky. So it's an opportunity for realignment. Um, people would gather and pray and meditate, um, go through periods of in introspection and take the opportunity for spiritual growth. So because the king, and you can see we've got our um, wonderful ruler, DJ Albo, um, our prime minister, Albanese, up there with that idea of, of the throne and the sun and kingship, the ruler of the nation was the mediator between the people and the gods. So eclipses 
were particularly influential in predicting the future of the king. If what they were doing on the ground wasn't aligned with the greater good or supported by the heavens, by divine mandate, their authority could be cut down. So eclipses were seen as an incredibly important marker of the ruler's relationship with the divine and there are clear political and social implications for um, eclipses. Like you can see, apply the eclipse to the chart of a nation and see what is going to unfold. And particularly when um, the landmass is kissed by the eclipse as Australia is this time. Now, you had some interesting stuff to share about eclipses too, Sam? Yeah, so um, the, I think the main reason that we're looking at this eclipse in particular is because of its connection to the ingress chart. My internet connection might be a little bit bad. But, um, yeah, so the main reason why we're looking at this eclipse is because of its to the ingress itself. Um, so this eclipse in particular, um, because it's happening at 29 degrees um, Aries, is pretty much connected to um, the ascendant of um, what's happening to Australia's people um, of the ingress chart and the natal chart. So it's telling us that this eclipse in particular is going to affect Australian people, the general public, quite strongly, more than other eclipses might. Total eclipses also don't happen that often. Like this is what's called, I think, a hybrid eclipse, um, and which is like obviously hybrid, meaning a number of different eclipses kind of fused together, but this one will actually be viewable from Western Australia, East Timor and East Indonesia. So that doesn't happen that often that we are actually able to view with the naked eye um, that um, when that happens, it is going to affect those areas. I gathered some really cool information. Communities of Southeast Australia saw eclipses. Um, and, you know, in some Aboriginal law, they saw the moon as being the man and the sun as being the woman. And that is actually more common in Australian Aboriginal law than not. So I'll just read a little bit because um, I think it's quite interesting. It's by uh, an author or he's a professor at the um, Melbourne, I'm sorry, Macquarie. I think he's at Melbourne Uni now. His name's Dwayne Hamaker. And he writes a lot of cool stuff. So to some Aboriginal communities of Southeast Australia, the sky world was suspended above the heads of the people by trees, ropes, spirits, or magical means. In Uolai oral traditions, the sun is a woman named Yi who falls in love with the moon man, Balu. Balu has no interest in Yi and constantly tries to avoid her. As the sun and moon move across the sky over the lunar cycle, Yi chases Balu, telling the spirits who hold up the sky that if they let him escape, she will cast down the spirit who sits in the sky holding the ends of the ropes and the sky world will fall, hurling the world into everlasting darkness. So mm -hmm. that is pretty much why there is a lot of law about um, eclipses being bad, you know. So to combat the omen of evil, some communities employed a brave and well-respected member of the community, such as a medicine man or elder, to use magical means to fight the evil of the eclipse. This typically included throwing sacred objects at the sun while chanting a particular song or set of words. And this practice was common to Aboriginal communities across Australia. Um, yeah. So I think it's interesting because talking about eclipses, you know, all cultures have used magical means to offset 
um, the negativity that can arise. And, and generally, solar eclipses are not positive events. No, um, because the sun brings all yeah, that light so it, and warmth. And when it's eclipse, when it's darkened by um, the, the shadow of the moon, that's generally bad news for light and warmth and vitality of things that are um, on Earth, including us. Yeah, so I think what we're just trying to say is this is quite a strong eclipse for Australia and it looks like because it's happening in the birth house of the ingress and um, of the natal chart that it will be something that affects us as a collective people in Australia. Yes, yeah, so here's the um, chart that... It- shows what um, you're talking about there, Sam. Um, This is the Australian Swearing Federation chart when um, all the states signed up to become the nation of Australia um, on the 1st of January 1901, and it's got 29 degrees Aries rising, and the outside chart on this bywheel clearly shows the sun and the moon together at 29 degrees. So this has a powerful impact on the Australian National Chart. Yeah, I had an interesting quote from um, Celeste Teal about angular eclipses in particular. She says, angular eclipses are the most notable for bringing substantial transformation, sometimes with a change in one area of life, leading to many other changes in rapid succession, like a domino effect. Now, she was writing about um, like personal charts, natal charts, but I think the, um, the... Sentiment is apt for mundane charts as well. Um, And also, too, when I was on time and date looking up the, um, you know, the the nuts and bolts of this eclipse and getting that beautiful picture that showed the trajectory over um, our region, it mentioned that Australia was going to have like five eclipses over its landmass in coming years. So being under kind of like the light of an eclipse um, is generally not something um, astrologers seek out. Um, You know, very ancient cultures generally or traditional cultures shield themselves from eclipse light. So the fact that Australia is spotlighted by several eclipses in a row leads to um, like change, like we're going to be in it for, um, Mm. you know, an extended period of time, which really makes sense of that um, upcoming Pluto um, return. Um, and yeah, it, I think we're going to be in for a, you know, hold on to you, hold on to your seat, bumpy ride over the next few years, because a lot is really shifting, um, you know, politically, internationally, um, you know, big changes. And I think you can see that too by Pluto at zero degrees Aquarius and the eclipse happening at 29 degrees, you know, like we're right on the cusp of like, and that they are called um, anoretic degrees, like those 29 degrees, which are like really unstable end, end of an era, end of a sign, um, showing like some kind of instability with something on the verge of change. But, um, you know, mm-hmm. like, Kind of like the um, key, like before you actually get into that newness, you're at that kind of end stage. And that also showed up in the ingress chart as well, where, um, you know, like Peter Dutton as the opposition leader is still dragging his heels. Yeah. Um, over this you know it's almost like a balsamic moon someone who is just like kind of like dragging the dregs of the last remaining light you know they're just kind of not they're still operating on old programs really old programs that you know aren't yet ready to go yeah. yeah. I, with mm, okay, so I think another thing, unless you had something, I think there's a little bit of a gap. Yeah, there might be a bit of a lag. Um, yeah, I, I get the sense with these, um, with that last degree of a sign, that there's that sense of um, wanting to, like, finish something. It's like the sense of being late 
and like almost forgetting something. It's like, I've really got to finish this thing. It's like super important. I know my time's running out. Maybe it's almost like defusing a bomb. Um, mm. but yeah, things are coming to a sense of um, completion, but there is renewal, but there is still unfinished business that um, needs to be taken care of. And yeah, one way of taking care of it is to have a solar eclipse on um, your national ascendant, I reckon. That'll take out the trash. We've had um, solar yeah. eclipses on the ascendant Hopefully. before and um, I wanted to sort of take people's mind back to um, 1996. There was an eclipse on the 17th of April and the 19th of April 2004. Both years had Black Hawk helicopter crashes. Um, so that picks up the military theme with the um, Mars rising, I'm sorry, the Aries rising of the Federation chart, which is a Mars ruled sign. Um, also in 1996, we had um, Port Arthur, the, the massacre, and in 2004 was Children Overboard. So I'm thinking in perhaps these um, in the next year, um, possibly in the next three months, given that um, Aries ingress is still very active, that um, there's a possibility that we'll arrive at a shocking two-word event kind of um, thing that gets etched into our national psyche, like something is going to, like, wake us up to what we've been doing and go, well, there's something wrong here. So I just think there, there, there is definitely drama with that Pluto at the top and it's, you know, going to be up to us to engage with something that perhaps we don't want to look at. And, yeah, yeah. Um, Maybe it could be the inherent so racism. <laughs> um, if it is the voice thing, um, I mean, because the voice has become a bit of a two-word slogan, but I, I don't know for sure if it is, um, you know, that, because that goes through legal channels. So, yeah, it, it doesn't seem to have the, the violence. It seems like a very um, peaceful offering through the Uluru Statement of the Heart. So I don't think that carries the um, the drama of uh, an angular eclipse square to Pluto on the MC. Like it, it just looks really um, quite jarring. And we were talking about what kind of um, drama could potentially be brought by an eclipse and Pluto on um, the two main angles of a national chart. Okay, so... I think the first thing for me um, was looking at the the terrible state of Mars in this. You know, Mars is the ruler of this eclipse. Um, so I think in the ecli actual eclipse chart, Mars, so the, the eclipse was happening in the eighth house, that, if I'm correct. In using um, I'll go back to the eclipse chart if you like. Let's yeah, because then we can see. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, so again, we've got that 12th house being activated, um, which was all over the ingress chart. Yes. Um, and it was very much about the same things that we were talking about. So um, Mars also rules over the people in the ingress chart. So because Mars was the ruler of the ingress chart, so it was talking about what's going to happen to the general population. Also includes the, the king or the prime minister as well as the 10th house um, mm. talks to the government. So to me, it kind of looks like um, I have wondered if there's going to be some kind of um, something happening with a, like a neighbouring culture like with East Timor or Indonesia or especially with connection to where the eclipse is going to be happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, because the sun last, I think the the let me see, what was the, so, yeah, so the sun just separated from 
Jupiter, um, which was on the ascendant in the ingress chart. Yes. And its next connection is to Saturn. And in Bernardi's, like, mundane, talks about mundane astrology, he does talk about um, what that means when you're, when the eclipse or, you know, the ingress chart, you know, the rulers of that chart, such as this one, the eclipse ruler is the sun, the last, you know, last touching um, Jupiter and then moving to Saturn kind of is talking about um, people in power because they're the superior planets. And so it's talking about, um, you know, people, maybe, you know, um, the rich, um, people in power, maybe religious, um, a religious movement, um, kind of uh, making decisions about um that are going, because it's an eclipse, that are going to harm um, the general public. Mm. So it kind of look, and because it's going to Saturn and Saturn's in the seventh house, it could also be talking about allies um, that we have. Um, So it kind of feels like, to me, like increased um, military involvement in something that we don't necessarily haven't chosen for ourselves Mm. yeah so you think like you're ignoring the um the connection with pluto because pluto is not a traditional um planet and bernardi didn't know it existed so that application from yeah the sun and also the moon the moon will go on to um, make the connection with Saturn after that square to Pluto I wondered if it wasn't um, like uh, some kind of trade agreement not necessarily like you know very well balanced um, or uh, because of that connection to you know with the sun and the moon approaching the ninth house cast if it would be like a visa agreement to expedite workers um, Mm. because Saturn rules the um the six house cusper as well um so like foreign workers coming to um you know basically prop up our economy um, yeah I also I'm- yeah thought that that um because this mars is in the fourth house of the um federation chart that that really says a lot about the housing um, themes and the housing crisis and the suffering of the people because of what's happening, like not being able to find a rental, not being able to, like, buy a property, um, you know, for, for love or money, although perhaps if you've got money you can still do it. But I think even because the property market's so volatile that investors aren't investing um, with confidence. So there's really something wrong with how we're managing our national wealth because I would say that that Mm. the eclipse is an eighth house I just think is a little bit wide Mm. from the the ninth house cusp so it's like about like our our debt um and taxation and superannuation um, and again, I've written this question, could it be the end of interest rate rises? I'm like, well, that's already happened. But the changes to taxation um, and like subsidizing of, um, you know, investment property, like I, like it has to happen. Like these, mm-hmm. the ingress chart, this solar eclipse chart ha- says that something needs to change with um, wealth accumulation, long-term wealth accumulation, the um the rise of like a, a moneyed elite in Australia, which goes against um, our national psyche where we like to fancy ourselves as equal and egalitarian. Um, it's We're developing an underclass, people that can't find homes, that are living under bridges, um, you know, mm. middle-aged women becoming, um, yeah, homeless and, you know, without superannuation, unable to support themselves when they're um when they reach a certain age it's it's appalling and this is a challenge um that's really present in this eclipse chart yeah because look again you know 
that Jupiter's connection to the fourth house, you know. So um, it's definitely talking about land, um, home ownership, crops. Um, so this is all in a, a difficult way. You know, Mars is in the sign of Cancer, which is the sign of the home, of family. Um, so, but I, another thing that kind of came up as well is I was wondering about, um, you know, because the 12th house also talks about people who need um, the care or help of the government, you know. So that could be something to do with pension. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like um, you know, income ben like benefits, like um, Centrelink benefits. Yeah, like welfare. Um, people that mm. need support. Yeah, so I'm wondering if there's because and because Mars is in a sign that it doesn't like to be in, mm -hmm. and it's ruling the eclipse. It generally says, um, and Mars is a malefic. Yes. Um, it is, it is saying it's not going to be good. Like, yeah. And with the sun and the moon, the moon ruling that um, Mars applying to Saturn as well, and that's connected with um, downtrodden people as well, people that are, you know, sort of on the lower echelons of society and, you know, if you're poor or injured, um, you know, disabled, um, like you're doing it tough right now and mm. not getting the, the benefit of that you know, supposedly exalted um, sun in Aries because it's been eclipsed. So it's almost like there's um, an, an interruption with the eclipse, like a disconnect between like the people that need the support and assistance and the powers that be. Like it, like there's no empathy there. Like it, mm. the, the message isn't getting through. It's um, yeah, not ideal. Yeah, I think I, think I was reading in some of the... Um... In some of the eclipse literature and the mundane astrology too, that um, when an eclipse happens in, um, you know, the sign like signs like Aries or fire signs, um, it is connected, but, and especially when it happens um, in the um, in the ascendant of a, of a, of the ingress chart or the nations chart. It's talking about how that eclipse is going to be um, detrimental maybe to young people as oh, well. Okay. Yeah, so um, that kind of, yeah, kind of goes along with that. Um, so yeah. it could be something Family about thing. welfare, yeah. yeah, maybe welfare benefits um, mm -hmm. being changed, which wouldn't surprise me at all. And I know there has been talk about, um, I know in the U.S., and I think um, in Australia, they, they, I think in Australia they've already done it to Aboriginal communities. The cashless welfare card. The cashless welfare card. Yes. Yeah. I've seen um, some, like some posting on social media by the Greens saying that Labor promised to repeal the cashless welfare card, um, but they're really just kind of like making it optional. And, I mean, how optional is it when you're dependent on like a, a government organisation for your welfare and, you know, your everyday necessities? And they go, you know what, I really think um, you'd benefit from this cashless welfare card. Like mm. it, there's a power imbalance there and, um, yeah, it's it doesn't it, raise people up um, and offer them autonomy, which is a big Aries theme, like autonomy, being able to, like, do your own thing, make your own decisions, make your own mistakes. Like it's mm. everybody's entitled to do that. And look at, the look at the, you know, the ruler of the second house right up there in the 10th house. Venus, mm. Venus is all about fun, um, you know, spending money on fun things, you know, in a, in a young person's sign, Gemini. Um, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they bring in something like that pretty soon, which will be, you know, for, you know, for some people they'll be like, you know, whatever, but mm. for people who do spend their money on like as young people do, having fun, <laughs> Yeah. You know, like it will yeah. really suck. So yeah. it, it it does. Um, 
yeah, there's pros and cons to that. Another little thing I saw in this eclipse chart is I looked at um, that stationary Mercury in the ninth house conjunct um, Uranus. I thought that was really interesting as, you know, theoretically that's like the um, leader of the government. So it kind of looks like Albanese, um, the prime minister, is a bit pen, penned in here. Like he kind of can't move and he's under sort of pressure. Um, and he can't move forward, but he's also not willing to go backwards if we just sort of look at this as a as a snapshot. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if he's not going to backflip on something somehow, like given that that Mercury is poised to go retrograde. Um, but the government is pretty popular with that um, Venus up there in the 10th. Like it, maybe the backflip isn't um, a bad thing. Maybe they won't be punished for um, what they're thinking of doing. There's also a mutual reception um, between that um, Venus and Gemini. Like they can't sort of see each other um, because they're in adjacent signs, but they're, um, you know, like, there's an interaction there um, based on because Mercury rules Gemini and Venus rules Taurus. Mm. So this definitely yeah, something I think, interesting. yeah, it looks like he's, because it's square the ascendant as well it looks like he's like oh i really don't want to come out with this like yeah. this is something that's going to like um come back and bite me on the butt so yeah. but it is about money definitely yeah, I just reckon that Venus somehow offers a degree of protection because they often talk about um the you know, because like Dutton and the Liberals are such a mess and don't really offer a reasonable alternative that um, the, the Labor government is getting an extended honeymoon, like, you know, Venus, like she's honey and sweet things and mm. there's the government, like, well, you know, compared to the other guy, these ones are all right. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I just will wonder what that backflip or that, oh, this kind of like thing that, like you say, he kind of, feels he has to do or will be taking a risk by doing or undoing, um, it's there. Um, and it could relate to him travelling, some kind of foreign policy or international relations, um, perhaps those laws. Again, you know, we sort of discount, well, not discount, but like perhaps we overemphasize the international component and the educational component of the ninth house and forget that it's law a law is what um keeps this kind of country running on um if we go back to that um constitutional quote i read like that the constitution is a law it's the highest law in the land and um, we've got that referendum question in front of us so yeah that is very interesting what um mr albanese is um you know, contemplating in his little methodical Taurus yeah. mind there. <laughs> I think, like, going back to Pluto, um, Pluto moving into a fixed sign mm. um, and an air sign um, does generally indicate increased control or over information um, so it's making a trine here to the midheaven mm. um, in the eclipse chart, and it's from the sixth house, though. Um, so that could be, um, you yeah, know, like government support for, um, like, the like wage cases that are coming up um you know workers not their wages not growing um in keeping with inflation I think there's been some discussion where the government's offered like in principle support of um raising the minimum wage for people mm. in like a lot of care professions like I think it's already happened for nursing home workers but there are other um industries that the government's on board with um raising the Wow. Yeah. So I think like sixth house is generally, um, you know, it can be health service. Yeah. So that is in line with that. The army, naval and civil service, um, workers and employees generally. So it does look like um, there could be a bit of a increase, but it's still from a place 
Um, so it's like kind of like giving to one and maybe taking from another while yeah. seeming like the good guy with Venus in um, yes. Gemini. Well, because they can't raise it as much as inflation has been progressing. So even if they get a raise, they still have gone backwards in real terms. So, yeah, it's, I don't know, yeah, it's bit of- sweet. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's really interesting, this chart. So um, would we be able to have a look at the um, solar eclipse chart, like as um, with the ingress chart? Uh, we can. I'll need to um, swap out from this and pop up solar fire. So ingress chart with... So, yeah, that's good. One, one thing that I came up with with timing, with um, timing eclipses, because it doesn't, like, happen, you know, all, no. like, on the 20th yeah, yeah. of April. Like, right on the dot, everything happen. changes. <laughs> yeah. It's like a, um, you know, sometimes eclipses can happen, like, over a year. Um, you know, these events all play out. With um, the timing, you can actually time it by using the ascendant of the eclipse um, and seeing when the sun will move to the ascendant. Um, and mm. so, so yeah, so I think that um, a few key times that I worked out for when things might manifest mm-hmm. are um, Gemini season, um, mm-hmm. Um, Gemini, sort of all around Gemini, um, Cancer and Leo because um, that's where Mars, the ruler of the eclipse is and also the ascendant of the eclipse. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. So when the yeah. sun comes along and activates um, the, Those points. the Ingress Mars and the eclipse Mars. Mm-hmm. And then the ascendant. Mm-hmm. Because you know, because it's a solar eclipse, it'll be activating the um the people. You know, it'll be having an effect upon the people, which are the first house. Mm-hmm. So there's some times, and it kind of isn't that far away. Maybe like two to three months away. Yeah. So, yeah. so it'll be interesting to watch what's happening around that time. Mm, definitely yeah that and because that mars in um you know with the eclipse chart um like if we go back to that um yeah with the because it was leo rising that uh, mars in the 12th it's almost like it's kind of like you know tucked away it's not something that we're like actively working on it's in the background and everybody's like oh gosh what can we do about this nothing um and then like when the sun comes along um yeah and it will be just after the winter solstice too, um, which mm. will be a time to cast a new mundane chart for the country as well. So, yeah. And that makes sense too because, like, look at those, you know, sun activating Mars. I don't know. It kind of feels like because it's Mars, I don't know, it kind of feels like it might be a bit traumatic. Yeah, look, and if... If, like, as we sort of saw with um, Peter Dutton and what he's done this week with his um, decision for the Liberal Party on The Voice, if this Mars in Gemini is a symbol for The Voice, um, when the sun comes to it, um, perhaps, like, the the messaging around um, the yes case and the no case will really heat up, um, Mm. like, because the sun's a hot planet and Mars is hot. And also, you know, Mars in Gemini is really um, kind of lacks a filter and um, can use words quite aggressively as a um, weapon. Um, It it looks like a lot of heated words um, if that rolls along, if the sun rolls along to um, Mars. Um, and that's very, and that's also in line with all that Pluto symbolism again. You know, like um, I've got this really great book on Pluto that um, it's an old book, but you know, he he says um, that the kind of um, significations of Pluto is he kills or destroys, but builds out of the elements of the destroyed. He's very much connected with revolution. In charts, like um, uprisings against 
some injustice. Um, he brings only that which has been developed undercover and in secret um, when the time is right. Um, he overthrows the old as well. Yeah, that's absolutely what this eclipse screams of and that, like, larger Pluto story. There are absolutely injustices and, um, you know, cruelty and dispossession that this um, country was based on when I was um, looking at the um, the colonisation chart, the invasion chart, um, Neptune's, like, right up there um, at the top of the chart. It's, like, terra nullius. It's the lie that um, set yeah. this whole thing up. Like, it, it, and it's time to call it out for what it is and do our best to um, make this country more equitable and um yeah it entails some really serious truth telling and um I know that that's a separate part of the Uluru statement from the heart but the voice is the beginning um and I just I just marvel at that Peter Dutton headline um yeah mm. camouflaging um is camouflaging and saying no like it's just that Neptune Moon to Neptune to Mars, and yeah, it's it's so amazing watching the land. you and seeing it just like you know, it's just like a total manifest. I love watching that too. Like it's like a total manifestation of the astrology. Yeah, yeah, it really is. But um, I think one interesting, just one more point about that Pluto is because it's squaring the um, I think it's squaring the yeah, squaring the eclipse, you know, moving from an earth sign, you know, Capricorn, which is very much connected to the dead, you know, Pluto in Capricorn. The past. Yeah. So he's Tradition. like, um, you know, in the last degrees of, you know, very deep kind of, you know, breaking up the bones of the dead, you know, and, and the ancestral voices. So yes. this might be some real karma. That Australia, because you know, you're talking about a return with the colonization chart, or um, yeah, and so kind of moving into the Aquarius, which is also like, um, let's finally that you know, it's the voice, mm -hmm. you know, so that is that is that I think that you've hit the nail on the head there about big part of what this will be about. Yeah, it, it, it feels like a really sort of, you know, astrology aside when I when I speak about it and when I see these charts, like there's this really kind of like, I wouldn't say heavy, but a weighty feeling like this is serious, like this is something that we have to do um, as citizens of this modern nation. Um, this is just, you know, the world we live in and this is a step forward and um it's not all going to be easy or pretty. There's going to be things that we have to look at that, um, yeah, are hurtful and um, hard to deal with. But by God, look, we've got um, an opportunity here. Um, mm. and, and it will be from the opposition. Look at that Mars down there. Mm. It, it'll, it'll probably be Dutton who's, like, kicking up a stink about it. Honestly, of all the bloody things he could kick up a stink about, like, you know, the, yeah, it just seems so petty. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> like there's so many more, like, like homeless people, like, you know, workers not being paid properly, like, you know, the rich getting richer, the, um, you know, the inequalities that are being hard baked into our society change we need to create it now and he's just like nah um you know it, what I, one thing i really am worried about in this chart that you know with pluto up there in the 10th as well and and it keep on i am really worried that something could potentially happen to albanese like some kind of um wow yeah like an incident so, that's threatening. Yeah, or some kind of change, you know, that, you know, some dramatic change in the government, mm. um, you know, especially with the eclipse. Yeah, it's not good for, it's rarely good for leaders. Um, eclipses mm. aren't great. So I hope um, he's okay. 
me having a, a bit of a cry for the PM. <laughs> I know. But yeah. I, you look at the alternatives and there's not much around and he's. That would be bad. Well, he hasn't done too bad. He seems oh, to Albert, be no, a little is. hard out. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, whether he can sort of, you know, steer the ship through this um, troubled eclipse waters is another thing. But, um, yeah, we just, mm. we will have to wait and see. Um, yeah. Well, I think that seems like a fitting place to end it as we, um, you know, reveal our political <laughs> affiliations <laughs> and <laughs> express our hope for the future. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for joining me for, um, you know, what's been an amazing discussion. I'm going to put your little um, contact details up now, Sam. Yeah. So tell us what you've been working on, anything like, you know, your consultations, your magical brews. Tell us what you've got. Your contact details are up there um, on the screen. Okay. Um, well, I am still primarily working as a um, medical and horary astrologer. I do a lot of work still with um, natal um, through some other work that I'm doing. But um, I've got a few plans um, for some releases in magical materia um, mm. coming up. So um, you'll have to keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, yeah, so there's a few things on the boil, there but is. yeah, I'm still available through um, yeah. through uh, mainly through Instagram. Yes, I haven't put your Instagram details up here. I've just realised my omission, but um, Sam is Three Fates Apothecary on Instagram, so you should definitely follow her and um, you know see what she's brewing up. Um, you do do amazing things and your posts are always like you know not your standard Instagram fair so I always love it when I come across one of your posts when I'm having a scroll here are my contact details if you're really not able to get enough of astrology you should come out and hang out in my magical mentoring group um, you get three self-paced courses on foundation astrology, moon magic, and also dreams and symbols. Um, it's not kind of like a pure intellectual astrology. We um, kind of like get in there and we work with the magical and the um, symbolic content that we're receiving from the outside world. We look at it astrologically and we really want to like do living astrology like it's a really great thing to engage with through that um, materia magica is excellent um to like remediate difficult trends as there's things you can do and like often astrology shows up in really mundane ways as well like you know you might be arguing with your boss or your partner or you might sort of have um some kind of niggling health issue or you're off to the dentist like astrology can show up in really mundane ways and like there are really sort of practical things you can do to um you know max out the good stuff mitigate the bad stuff and really achieve the best outcome for you and this is what we do in um the small group i run um it's not the place where you get um, lost in the crowds um there's no onerous commitment um, and you kind of get to choose the level that um, you engage at, whether you attend live or catch the recordings and how much you share with the group. So please check that out. Here are my um, social details. Um, and I'll put Sam's um, Instagram thingy down the bottom in the write-up for this when it gets onto YouTube. Thank you very much, Sam. You've been amazing sharing your um, wisdom with us. And, um, yeah, look forward to cancer season when maybe we'll do um, the solstice chart. Yeah, that'd be cool. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.